I'll only talk for a minute, so it doesn't really matter either way. Um, my name is Dana Hart. I'm the director here at Ilsley Public Library. Uh, First Wednesdays is the monthly Council for the Humanities, uh, hosted by the Vermont Humanities Council, the first Wednesday of every month uh, in nine towns around Vermont. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank our statewide underwriters, the Alma Gibbs Donchian Foundation, the Wyndham Foundation, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the Vermont Department of Libraries. I also want to thank um, our series underwriter, the residents at Otter Creek. And of course, I want to thank our library sponsor, the Friends of the Library, without whom uh, none of this would be possible. Tonight's speaker, Peter Travis, retired in 2015 from Dartmouth College, where he taught courses in Chaucer, Medieval Drama, Old English and Icelandic Literature, Men's Studies, and Literary Theory. His major field of interest has always been Chaucer, and his book, The Seminal Chaucer, won the Brooks Warren Prize for Excellence in Literary Criticism in 2010. In his courses on Chaucer, he encouraged his students to develop their skills in reading Chaucer's Middle English aloud with <coughs> accuracy and dramatic insight. Please join me in welcoming Peter Travis. Happy to be back. Um, uh, with Chaucer, and I, what I'm doing in my quotes retirement, among other things, is teaching a variety of courses uh, on Chaucer uh, and on Old English uh, and on Icelandic sagas, uh, and, uh, but it's been some time since I've done Chaucer. So what do I want to do tonight? I want to have a kind of collaborative experience with you all <laughs> Uh, as we talk about Chaucer, read some Chaucer aloud, do some literary critical interpretation of Chaucer, all the time as I am trying to tell you as much as I can uh, about Chaucer and why I love Chaucer, why we should all read Chaucer, um, uh, and um, really have a good time uh, with Chaucer. I've managed to talk to almost half of you uh, as you were coming in, and it's interesting to see how many of you um, have had an experience with Chaucer. So let's just uh, raise hands. How many have had an experience either reading on their own or reading in a class uh, Chaucer? Look at, look at that, isn't that incredible? That's amazing. Now if, Lucy? Abby, Abigail, sorry. Huh, Abby? Abby. Abby's doing this, uh, is reading Chaucer on her own. But Abby, I think that if we had people your age sitting here and I asked that question, there would be far fewer hands because the interest in or the experience of or the sort of the uh, political correctness or just the, the, uh, or the cultural necessity of studying Chaucer seems to be diminishing and dying out uh, in our culture. And I'm not here to uh, scream lamentations uh, about that because other kinds of literature are, are, that are very, very good at taking their, uh, their place. But I, if there is a propagandistic part of my talking, it is uh, let's keep Chaucer, uh, uh, let's keep uh, Chaucer going. So um, what do we know about Chaucer? We know he existed. Uh, we know that he was uh, a fairly important uh, person in the employ of kings of England, actually three of them, Richard II being the most uh, important. He was on the inside of the outside of the inner circle uh, of people who were uh, politicians and uh, uh, in the employ, who, you know, he was clerk of the king's work, for instance. He was the king's forester. He was uh, the, the tax, uh, uh, the tax uh, de uh, deputy for the wool trade. We were talking about the wool trade back here which is the most important trade in, uh, in all of England. Uh, he was uh, a, a, a member of uh, the parliament for a few, uh, for a few days, uh, for a few, it was a few days, it was less than a, uh, less than a, a year. Uh, he fell out of favor. He could have uh, lost his, uh, his head if uh, politics hadn't gone in this direction or that direction. Uh, he was married or he married a woman of uh, considerable social stature. Uh, who they did not seem to live together that, uh, that much, which is not all that unusual. Uh, she lived uh, uh, with the queen. She was a consort of, of the queen. They had a son. Um, but, uh, and there are, I think, 476 entries in uh, Chaucer's life works. That is evidence of what he did as a person in the world uh, throughout his life. 
not one of those, this is my point, had anything to do with his having written poetry. In other words, he was not uh, held up as a kind of po uh, poet laureate or anything like that. He was not even recognized in any kind of formal way uh, uh, as a poet. When he died in 1400, um, people knew uh, that he had written poetry on the continent in France. Uh, people knew that he was a very accomplished uh, translator, but within a generation after his death, he rather dramatically, rather suddenly became the father of uh, English poetry. And the handout I, I, I've given you, although it's in black and white, um, has the first page of the Ellesmere Manuscript. Uh, and uh, the, the original is extremely handsome. It's a presentation copy, and uh, it's now in the Huntington Library in Pasadena. Uh, I got a wonderful grant there for a year, and I would walk by uh, the Ellesmere Manuscript and genuflect, uh, which, is, uh, was, which is the right thing to do. So within a, within a generation, uh, he was recognized as a major uh, poetic voice, and he's had, has had extraordinary influence uh, since then, Scottish Chaucerians in the 15th century, Shakespeare is very influ influenced by Chaucer, many, many writers, T.S. Eliot, uh, coming up to the present. It is interesting that um, Chaucer, unlike Shakespeare, has not had an, uh, an overweening influence on popular American or English or European culture. I just recently re reviewed a book called Chaucer on Screen, Chaucer on Screen. And the first four articles uh, are about why is Chaucer not on screen? You know, you have all sorts of Shakespeare plays on screen, all sorts of variations, right? Can you name a few of them? Remember Shakespeare in Love? Okay, on and on and on. No, there's no Chaucer in Love or anything like that. Uh, and probably one of the major reasons is, is he is a narrative poet, whereas Chaucer is a dramatist. So it's rather less daunting to take a Shakespeare play and make it into a movie than to take a Chaucer play and, uh, no, not a Chaucer play, it's a slip, uh, a Chaucer poem, narrative poem, and make it into something visual or dramatic because his is poetry which is read through the voice of the poet. And if you take the narrative voice out of the subject or the plot, uh, representation of uh, the poem, you don't have too, uh, too much left. So all by way of saying, it really is important to read Chaucer as poetry, and it's important to hear it as poetry, and if it's at all possible, it's important to hear it as, um, uh, as, as, as Middle English poetry. So we are going to um, read some of that poetry ourselves. The poetry is, as you remember, in Middle English, which needs to be distinguished from Old English. Old English is uh, the name for uh, the language that was spoken from, say, the 8th century to the 11th century. And from the 11th century, 1066 and all that, up until, say, Shakespeare's time, you have Middle English, and then you have Early Modern English, and then you uh, move into uh, Modern English. Um, old English, let me pause there for a moment, um, sounded like this. This is the first poem to have survived uh, that represents what the poetry was like in the 8th century, okay? We're in the 8th century now. Uh, and it's called Cadman's Hymn. Some of you may remember. Okay. Nushon uh, Herian, heaven reaches ward, may it hold his machta, and his mod ye thank. Werk, wilderfader, swa ye wonder ye was, eche trichten, after theoda, firum foldan, freya almichti. Any, you know, Rorschach um, responses to this? Say it again? Help. <laughs> Help. No, I just, I, I want something very sort of imaginative, subjective, off the wall, impressionistic. It sounds, it sounds sort of Scandinavian. Keep on going. It sounds, it sounds sort of German. Well, Scandinavian uh, languages are Germanic languages, all right? And English in the 8th century was entirely a Germanic language. 
Now, if you want to get into uh, you know, linguistic theory and taxonomies and things like that, you say, well, what do you mean? What defines a language uh, as this rather than that? But if you look at the, the trees of Indo-European language, you see branches. They're the Romance languages, and then they're Germanic languages. And over here, we have Icelandic and Scandinavian languages uh, and English. Anything else that you heard? Nushel and Herian, Heaven reaches Ward, Meatotis, Machta, and Dismodiathank. What does it feel like as poetry? As you said? A very strong cadence, right? In fact, there are four stresses into what we would now call a line. I think of it as, you know, when I chop wood, right? Funk, thunk, funk, thunk. Also, and that's what, all the poetry was written that way, all right? You had two on verses and two off verses with a big sejura break in the middle. Um, and then all of the lines are alliterated, remember, going back? So every, uh, every line will have three or two alliterations, but not rhyme. One more thing about Old English poetry, because it's still on my mind, having just said goodbye to it, um, is that uh, it was, uh, we know for certain, performed alive. In fact, constructed, um, not impromptu fashion, but fashioned on the spot. That a shope, as he was called, like a bard, would sing it or chant it while playing a harp, and he could expand or contract his performance uh, according to his mood or to uh, how long he thinks his uh, audience is going to be with him and so on. So this is called oral formulaic poetry. And Beowulf, uh, the great masterpiece that I just finished uh, last week, uh, was an oral formulaic poem, although what we have now is a very literate version of that poem. So that's Old English poetry. When we move into Chaucer's language, what has happened? Okay, now we're going to do some reading of Chaucer. Now let me give you a little bit just so you can hear it and let us know what your first impressions are. And some of you who have memorized these lines are going to go back and listen to you. Okay, but Juan uh, April with a sure sota, the draught of March hath pierced to the rota, unbothered every vein and switched liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the floor. When the fierce ache with a sweeter breath, in spirit hath in every holt and haith the tender croppus, and the youngest son hath in the realm of half his course he runner, and smaller fool is. I got to stop there halfway through the 18 lines. What's your, what's your feel for this language, or what is the feel of the language? What's happened to it? For, more, melodic. more melodic, okay. And by melodic, you mean. You feel that there's, I mean, it's not so much that chopping rhythm, right, but it feels more mellifluous, right? And in fact, these lines have moved into what becomes the standard kind of prosody, that is, uh, ryth rhythmic scheme for English poetry. Anybody recall what that is? Iambic pentameter, right? Iambic pentameter. Chaucer actually brought that, uh, that prosodic scheme into the English language influenced by uh, Italian poetry. But it wasn't there to begin with. And then it then sort of became extraordinarily uh, popular. So you have a different, you still have the four major uh, uh, beats or stresses, and then you have a slightly less pronounced one, so that's the fifth. And then you also, in addition, Chaucer brought this in, uh, you don't have to have it at all, but it's very popular, you will have rhymes in couplets, okay? Rhyme, 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 A, A, B, B, uh, C, C. Okay, uh, so what enough about the language, I think. So Chaucer, throughout his career, although he wrote, and he tells us, in the wee hours of the night by candlelight falling asleep, because he had a job, he needed a day job, uh, but he, um, he wrote an extraordinary number of poems. Um, he started off the way you should if you were a good uh, wannabe poet, uh, writing dream visions. Uh, he started off, uh, if you want to be uh, an accomplished uh, and much beloved or at least admired poet, uh, writing about love and what kind of love, courtly love. 
Um, he, uh, the dream visions were, well, uh, the, uh, one of them was House of Fame, which is a kind of parodic imitation of um, Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. Chaucer was, uh, I didn't put this in first time through in his biography, he was an ambassador for Richard II and he went to Italy four times and while he was doing business stuff uh, for the king he also was learning a lot about Italian uh, uh, literature and like Italian uh, poetry so he wrote his own sort of parodic version of uh, the Divine Comedy. He wrote four, three or four other dream visions and then he wrote Troilus and Crusada which is, quote me on this, the greatest English poetic narrative poem, first narrative poem in the English language, Troilus uh, and Crusada. All of this bringing us up to his last major work with, for the last 14 years or so of his life, and that is, uh, that's the Canterbury Tales. So that's where we are going uh, rather rapidly into, into the Canterbury Tales. Now, uh, the Canterbury Tales are tales. They are a collection of stories. Uh, we might call them short stories, or some of them extremely long, uh, some of them are extremely short. What makes them original are many things, but one is that Chaucer decided to do something that had simply never done before. Not only is he going to have a list of narratives, as say Boccaccio does, the Decameron, A Hundred Tales, uh, he's going to have each of these tales told by an individual. And that individual is going to be described by the poet uh, in the general prologue. And we're going to be working on one of the, pro, uh, the, uh, the portraits uh, in a minute. So rather postmodern decision to say, you're going to read uh, or hear, because Chaucer would read his poems aloud, we know that, as well as pass them around in manuscripts among a uh, coterie, a small group of, of literati, uh, in London and Oxford and Cambridge, etc. Um, but uh, that he would design each of these tales so that they could be understood as revealing a great deal about the character of the, the, the pilgrim, but also the tales are going to sort of work against the grain of the expectations or the intention of the pilgrim. So that's, there's, it's going to be a, a two-way reading of, uh, of what is going on. Because after all, Chaucer is telling these, he's designed these tales. So one of the questions one always asks in reading Chaucer after a while is, where is Chaucer in all this? What does he believe in? Will the real Chaucer stand up? Um, because he's telling a tale, but the tale is told by somebody else, and Chaucer himself, do you follow me, is on the pilgrimage. Oh yes, this is a pilgrimage. The third major point, frame narrative, uh, collection of tales, but all told uh, while people are trotting along or walking along on their horses or on foot. Where? To Canterbury. So it's a very English setting. And from London to Canterbury, yeah, um, it would take maybe three, three days and Chaucer comes up this, with this wonderful conceit that 30 pilgrims are going to meet by chance at an inn outside um, London and they will decide with the help of this rather abrasive and macho uh, and pain in the ass but lovable um, guy, Harry Bailey, who was the innkeeper, uh, that uh, he would be in charge of their pilgrimage and he would decide who wins uh, the, 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 the prize. What? Who wins the? No, it's going to be a competition. So everybody's going to tell a tale, two tales going up, everybody's going to tell two tales coming back, and everybody's going to come back to the Tabard Inn, that's Harry's place, and uh, spend more money on room and on, uh, and, and on food. So it's a wonderfully sort of inventive uh, set of conceits as to how to bring together a number of different works of literature that are extremely various uh, in their genre. But before we get to the variety of these tales, I want to spend some time on the, uh, the general prologue and one of the portraits there. But even before that, I want to spend some time on what some of you still remember, that is the, general pro the introduction to the general prologue. How many of you, Name, I ask, uh, memorized the opening 18 lines? 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. I pause for a moment because um, uh, when I'm on a plane and, and my seatmate finally stops talking and turns to me and says, well, then what do you do? Uh, I've got to make a quick judgment call. If I say, well, I'm a medievalist, that's the end of the, of the conversation. It's supposed to be funny. Okay, what the hell is a medievalist? But if I say, um, I teach Chaucer, more often than not, they'll say, oh, what the rock will live ashore of Sota? But it's, it, I was talking to you before we started, it, it's dying out, this tradition, this sacrosanct tradition of, of, of memorizing those opening 14 lines. So let's turn to them. And I'm going to ask for, okay, the, this is the handout now. Let's do it this way. <clears throat> um, would anybody like to volunteer to read at least, oh, everybody's scowling already. Would anybody, we would be so supportive. Yes, okay. This is Lewis? Lewis, okay. A little applause for Lewis even before he stops. Uh, well, I noticed you had a few things added that I didn't learn or I forgot. But the way I remember it is, on that opera lute is shorter sota, the throck to march that pierced it to the whole. And vada de vivain in sush ligur, a wish engender it is a flur. When Zephyrus acre with his sweat the break, inspired that in every hope and hate, the tender crocus and the younger sota. Well, we don't want them to stop, do we? <laughs> and does somebody else like to take it from there? Yes? And the younger sona hath in the round the south of course in runner, and smaller fuller smacked in melody, that sweeten out the meat to the open ear. So pretty can the hear in here for eyes, than long and folk to grown and fill gromages, and palmers for to say can strown the strondus, for fair in the halvus, fruit and some humundus, and specially from every shears and of England the Canterbury. The holy blissful martyr for to sake that him of hope and one that thy were sake. Applause, <laughs> huh? It sounded even a little Scandinavian in there. And your name is again, sorry? Rachel. Rachel, lovely. Any comments on what we've just. What? I speak Dutch and I think that. Uh huh. Um, I didn't speak Dutch when I first learned it. Okay. But then I did learn it and I have to find some similar. Sure. Well, Dutch and, Dutch and Flemish are very close to English, and especially Middle English, yeah. right? Okay, impressions, thoughts, or questions. Uh, now, we can talk about the language, we can talk about the poetry, we can talk about what this is actually saying, because this is a kind of tour de force opening to this major, major masterpiece. Chaucer knows if I'm going to write something really big, this is it. Thoughts, questions, yes? Mm -hmm. Almost like they are walking on the pilgrimage. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, whether it's horse or foot. Yeah. It does have a step by step. Yeah. It. Yeah. It's got a very melodious sound. Right. Well, that's you know that's the iambic pentameter. Yeah. Uh, I find bicycling uh, it's great to, uh, <laughs> to to recite these lines. Other thoughts or impressions or questions. I got some for you. Yes. Okay, and this is right before the, and Palmas, where are we? Yeah, 15. Uh, and Palmas for the sake, okay, let us speak and write that. So pricketh him not sure and here courage. See where I am, line 14 or so then, okay? Yeah. Then long and fo folk to go on, on pilgrimages, and Palmas for the sake and strange strangers, to Ferna Hallways Cooth and Sundry Londas. So uh, let's, let's sort of back up and then go forward again. We are opening up at what time of the year? Okay, spring. Namely, the, sort of the transition from the drought of March, okay, 
And so we are in the drought of March now, the dryness of March, moving into April, the sweet showers and so on, bathing the vein in sweet liqueur, all right? And we have Zephyrus, okay, the west wind, uh, tender crocus and so on, beautiful, sensuous, even sensual uh, descriptions of everything budding into life. You've got the, help me out here, the little birds hopping up and down. Why are they hopping up and down? They're what? <laughs> I think you said the right thing. What? Oh, no. They're, they're in fact, it's just the opposite. They're hot. I mean, it, it's just sexual energy. They're jumping up and down because this is the beginning of the sort of elan vital, the erotic vitality of life coming back into. Uh, you know, it's, you're thinking about our winters. <laughs> okay. And so, so pricketh them not sure in here garages in our, in our hearts. Then, it's interesting, you have all of this uh, description of nature coming after, you know, after a terrible winter, coming back into life. And you see it in the vegetal level, you see it on the animal level, right? Uh, and then, you know, what, what, I mean, this is all just one sentence, by the way. And then Chaucer says, then long and folk to do what? Did you, did you get the sort of what? <laughs> you know, they should go off and gather flowers, or they should go off into the, in the greenswood, or they should go off and propose, or they should go off and make love. You know, that's what everybody else is doing in the world. But then long and folk to go on, on pilgrimages. And Palmer's, the question was, what are Palmer's? Even today. No, no, palm, palm branches. Yeah, pilgrims, okay. Okay, to go to foreign shrines, and especially coming local, and every shares end of ankle onto country, they went to the holy blissful martyr for to Seca that emeth holpen when that they were Seca. So I think in terms of human nature, or human desire, or human need, or human lack, or divine, da, divine need, divine uh, designs, divine lack. It's an amazingly rich uh, melding together of the physical and the spiritual, of the biological, the sexual, uh, the, uh, the otherworldly. All of these forces, this is sort of like what you see in, in, in Dylan Thomas and so on, surge through these pilgrims as they feel impelled to do what? To go to the shrine of a saint who's a martyr who died to, you know, to, to save the church as he saw it from the, uh, from the trepidation, I mean, from, 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 the, uh, from the attack of you know, the enemy, the devil, or what have you. But most importantly, you go as a pilgrim to try to uh, wash your soul and to better yourself. And this is the season of Lent as well. So a very complicated way of reading um, Wonderlust, okay? It could, rel it could well be, you take the, the image, the trope of the pilgrimage as an analog to the pilgrimage of life. So this is the context in which these tales are, are set. And each of them, as I mentioned, is attributed to a, a, a different pilgrim. So with my eye on the time, uh, we're going to move to a portrait. And uh, forgive me if this is a little bit breathless, but I want you to uh, interject thoughts fast as we go through uh, this portrait of the monk. See where we are? Okay, and we don't have a translation to help, although we have some notes down here. Let me ask you first, monk. Okay, what do you think of? What, what defines a monk? What, what do you think a monk uh, must? Spirituality, keep on going. What? Celibacy. Okay, matter of fact, there are three uh, virtues that a monk or any religious uh, pledges his spiritual allegiance to. One is celibacy or chastity, poverty, and obedience, those three, okay. We're doing so well, so what else comes into your mind when you think of a monk? Friar Tuck. For, oh, Friar Tuck. Okay, that's another kind of monk, right? And what, what's the Friar Tuck kind of monk? Uh, well, it's very large, wears brown clothes, tauntured, and... Tauntured, yes. And he is, what? 
Yeah, drinks a lot. He, he, he's a bon vivant, right? Yeah, I mean, he's a very physical man. He's a very jolly, happy man. He's a, he's a good friend. He's a sort of proto-Falstaffian and things like that. Other images, just ideas or ideals when you think of the monk. Any darker sides to your thoughts about monks? Any bad stories ever told about monks? Oh, well, tell me. Oh, Rand, we were just talking about Mead. Okay. Keep on going. I mean, what? I did. Randy. Oh, did you say Randy? Randy. Yeah, very sexual. Oh, Randy, not Brandy. Randy, right. Okay, that there are many stories <laughs> uh, about monasteries as being the dens of iniquity. Many. S- what? They don't wear underwear. <laughs> well, what that actually means, I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. But. Monks, uh, I mean, Fabio, we'll get to Fabio in a minute. These are wonderfully well-designed, dirty stories that abounded in the Middle Ages. And there's always a triangle. Okay, there's the husband, who's never quite very smart. Okay, there's his young, voluptuous wife, who's really hankering for action. And then there's a a third uh, part of the triangle. And more often than not, he's a randy monk, okay? So you have, I mean, the anti-clerical satires written in the Middle Ages were legion. Every, I mean, people read Chaucer and say, oh, he was so against the church. Everyone was against the church in a literary way because they had such high ideals of what churches are. Okay, so this is my way of opening them up. I'm going to start reading, and we're going to go somehow through all these lines and say many brilliant things very fast, and forgive me if I sort of... I'm a little bit, or we are a little bit breathless, okay? And it's going to be Middle English, but anything you want to say. A monk there was, a fair for the maestria, an outri there that loved veneria, a manly man to bane an abbot abel. Comments? Venery. Oh, venery. Who said that? Why did you say venery? Sorry about this. Yes, venery is an ornament less. What do your notes say? Hunting. Hunting. Well, which is it? Both. <laughs> I would say both is pretty good. Yeah. But, I mean, I, the surface level here would be he likes to hunt. Right? But look what happened to your dirty minds. You started thinking about, you know, what's going on. Okay. Uh, And by the way, as we go through this, what we're going to be watching is what happens to our minds and what's going on in Chaucer's self-presentation because there's a kind of complicated dialogue between those two personae. Okay, Uh, manly manly man. For many a dainty horse had he in us in stable, and when he rode, men meeked his bridle hair, jingling in a whistling wind, alt's clare, and ache as lewd as doth the chapel bella, there as his lord was caper of the cellar. All pretty okay. What do you want to say here? Anything you want to remark on? Happy. Okay. He's cer- happy, or he certainly has a lot of energy, right? A lot of pleasure in the uh, the, the pleasurable elements of uh, of life. Uh, he likes horses. Right? The cell means the wine cell. Uh, well, the cell. No, uh, the cell is actually the the, the, the monastery, the, the cl- cl- claustration, okay, all right. But it's, it's fairly neutral, although you might for a moment pause and say, I thought maybe Chaucer would have got, or he would have got to something else. I mean, we're getting into his lifestyle. What are we not seeing? We don't see this monk as taking the vow of poverty. Matter of fact, if you turn it around, underline it, and, and what can you say about this? Are horses expensive? Does riding have anything to do with the you know, cloistered life? No. I mean... Visiting the sick? What? <laughs> oh, oh, yes, you know, that's right, visiting the sick, right? Okay, well, you see how, although Chaucer, little, little, little C Chaucer here, is, you can see that he's so enthusiastic, he likes this guy, right? This guy, is, this is a real man, all right? And look at, look at how um, enthusiastic he is about all of this riding, et cetera. Okay, he yaf not of that text a pullet hen, that saith that hunches may not holy men, 
Nay, that a monk, when he is wretched, is leaked until a fish that is water lace. This is the saying, a monk out of his cloister. So he gave that text on a pulled hen. What does the text say? And he says, hey, I, don't, I, don't, I don't give a fig for that. Do you follow that? The rule of St. Morris and St. Benate. What is that rule? You can make it up. Huh? Yeah, be, yeah, Benedictine rule. But what do you imagine the Benedictine rule says to how you should behave in, in your vocation as a monk? Restraint. Humility. Humility. Hard work. Uh, few, few words. <coughs> you know, honoring the, 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 uh, the liturgy. Very, you know, Benedictine rule is, is very conservative. What does he think of this? Thumbs down, right? Thumbs down. But what does he do instead? What does he like? The new order, the new style of things. Okay, that's the old. That's the old style of uh, the uh, clo uh, the cloister life. He's going for the new style of the cloister. And you know, you always have change, right? And what's happening with these monasteries? They're getting rich, right? They're endowed. That's one way of looking after your soul, is leave a lot of money to the monasteries. So this is what happens, did happen, absolutely. They get bigger, more complicated enterprises, they get you know, many, many hectares of land, they have to have laborers and things like that. And so he's an outrider. What's an outrider? Yeah, he, I mean, he rides out, I mean, literally rides out, and he's an entrepreneur, a businessman. You know, he's dealing with the outside world. He's dealing with exchange. He's dealing with sales. He's, deal, he's dealing with money. He's dealing with the, the secular economy because you have to, right? This is the modern world. You have to. Now, you know, there are arguments about everything in Shawsbury. One is that, oh, that shows you how um, venal he is. But many, many real monks have read and said, listen, this is the way things work uh, in the world. Okay, so you see where we are now? And you sort of see where Chaucer is, he said. Well, what the Chaucer's next uh, line is, and he said his opinion was scowed. Now, I is the most powerful word in the English language. I said his opinion was good. That makes sense. Are you with me here? It makes sense that the new order is the, the, the way to go rather than to go backwards to the, uh, to the, the old-fashioned ways. What should he study? Translate that for me. Why should he study? And why should he mock, mock himself in woad? Drive himself crazy upon a bulk in cloister all way to poor. Why should he sit there reading those old books? You know, those psalms and meditations and things like that. Or swinking with his hands. Or work with his hands, right? And labor, as Austin, that's Augustine bit. Okay, the, the, the old order is that, you know, you pray and you work, right? We do, and, 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 you, and, and you read your religious texts. He says, that's the old way. We don't do that. I think his opinion was good. He asked this rhetorical question, right? Therefore, let Austin, sorry, uh, let Austin have his swing to him reserved. So where are we so far, more than halfway through this portrait? Where is Chaucer? And where are we vis-a-vis -vis this remarkable uh, monk? Huh? What opinion do we have? Well, the monk is a changed monk from Benedict. Yeah. And he's uh, modern. He's modern. And uh, he's uh, very admirable. Yes. For Chaucer. Does everybody agree with that? No, I don't. <laughs> Why not? You, you, you went like this. So Chaucer was not a satirist, I pronounce, but he was an extraordinary ironist. 
ironist, right? But irony is an extraordinarily complicated uh, set of uh, maneuvers. You know, we have soft irony and, and, uh, and hard irony and things like that. But Chaucer seems to be saying, if we read him in a friendly, supportive, um, sympathetic fashion, saying, this all makes sense to me, you know, in, in, in a quiet little voice, right? That uh, this is what he's doing. This is what he's up to. This is the, the, uh, the new ways uh, of the world. So let's often have his swing to him reserved. Okay, so you follow the, uh, the reasoning, the argument of our narrator who may be becoming a somewhat slightly unreliable narrator with me, which puts you as reader in a complicated position vis-a-vis -vis how far are you going to go agreeing, how far are you going to go in disagreeing with this, uh, with this voice. Okay, now we're going to go through from here right to the very end. Therefore, watch, look out for Chaucer's therefores. Therefore, he was a precursor a reek. And precursor means, first meaning anyway? Okay, a horseman. Although something else may be coming into your mind. Grey Hoondis he had as swift as fool and fleet, of pricking and of hunting for the hara, was all his lust, for no cost wolt he spara. He say his slave is perfilled at the hand with grease, and that the finest of a land. For to festen his hoed under his chin, he had of gold he wrought a full curious pin, a love cannot in the greater end there was. His haid was, are you, are you following pretty well? Yeah. Okay. His haid was ballad that shone as any glass, and ache as fast as hay had been anoint. He was a lord full fat and in gold point. His e in stape and rolling in his haid, that stame it as a furnace of a laid. His boat is supple, his horse in great astart, knew certainly he was a fair prey lads. He was not pall as a four-peened ghost. A fat swan lived he best of any roast. His palfrey was as brune as is a barrier. Thoughts, impressions, questions, underlinings, yes? Do you have the uh, eye at the top of that column as Chaucer or the innkeeper? Who does the eye refer to? No, the eye is Chaucer the narrator. But, you know, as we, when we always tell stories and say, say, so, and there I was, dude, last night, and I couldn't believe that I did such and such, the I is a kind of construct of ourselves, all right? And so this is Chaucer using, you know, it's Chaucer saying he went on this pilgrimage, but he's also con constructing a persona who may not be entirely reliable. But it is Chaucer, we don't know what else to call him, all right, the narrator. Thoughts about what we what we see going on here? What? He's not poor. He's got horses, hounds. He's got a squirrel lined sleeve. Right. He likes to eat. What does he ever he like to? I mean, does he ever like to eat? <laughs> I mean, and and a fat swan. How many have, people have had a swan eating swan? This guy is a gourmand over the top, right? In fact, this guy looks like he's a roast himself, right? Uh, he, you know, he, he's coming out of, the, uh, out of the oven. He is an amazing physical formation. It's all physical, right? Where's the spirituality? I mean, he's sort of, he is sort of the epitome of raw physical corporeality uh, and the energy that goes along with it. He's so worldly. But is there any strain of any kind of Christian foundation or belief. Two more minutes. The last few lines. He was not Paul as a four-peened ghost. What does that mean? He wasn't pale, he wasn't pale as, a, as a tormented spirit. As a tormented spirit, I don't say to me. Okay. He wasn't pale as a tormented spirit. Now, put on your thinking caps. When you think about Christianity, when you think about Christian art, when you think about major Christian spirits, forces, souls, uh, heroes, martyrs, uh, paintings by the Dutch masters or by the Italians or the Spanish, what kind of images come into your mind that would be, what? St. Sebastian, and tell us a little bit more about St. Sebastian. Pierced with arrows. Pierced with arrows, in agony, right. Right. Other other images like that. Not a lot of smiling going on. 
Not a, no. The, the one question that they did ask is, did Christ ever smile in the, in the New Testament? It was, it was an argument. Not much smiling, right. Pale, skinny. Pale, skinny. Matter of fact, skinny, so, so rib showing. Okay, the flagellants, it would be an extreme. Yeah, right. El Greco's uh, saints would be an example. But the ultimate archetype of the four painted ghost is Christ himself. Is that all right for me to editorialize that way? Point being, you're not supposed to think of that, right? But I think Chaucer is hoping that his readers would say, wait a minute, what are we doing? Because it's so pejorative. Thank God he's not a four-peated ghost. But the physical and spiritual male ideal of Christianity are the four-peated ghost, four, four ghost types, okay? So just by way of saying, this is a complicated poem. And the kind of dance, interpretive dance, uh, between reader and, 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 and narrator is a complex one where you are given an extraordinary amount of freedom and responsibility to land on where you do finally land vis-a-vis -vis the value of this human being as a Christian and as a man uh, and as other things. Yeah? Was uh, the vision of uh, you know, success because of uh, the wool trade yeah. and the like, and the burgers getting fat and enjoying that aspect of life, moving away from the skinny vision of what we should be as Christians Oh, the burger, well, the burger, sure. The burger would be uh, rotund or, you know, in, in, in wonderful clothing and things like that. Now, whether or not that is something to be fully admired uh, is, you know, is something else. There are many images of <coughs> contemporary figures being led off to hell, and the burger is one uh, who is just the epitome of self-indulgence. Um, but, I mean, for, for me, the, the, the real keystone would be images of Christ. And in the 14th and 15th century, it is the extreme uh, uh, image of the physically wan and tortured uh, Christ, which is uh, celebrated at great, at great ends until finally he is dying on the cross and then, and then dead on the cross. So that would be your, your archetype. But one of the questions that we, you'd ask is, okay, where, what Chaucer does in his general prologue is he gives people from every different plane of, of society. So he is, we are being asked to judge every one of these individuals in terms of their own vocation, in terms of their own professions of, uh, of, of moral, uh, of moral uh, ideals. And, and also in terms of our, our, of our own sense of where we might be, we have to judge these people even as we judge ourselves or judge ourselves for us as we judge these people. Okay, I'm going to change, uh, <coughs> uh, change directions here from this poem, I'll call it a poem, this portrait, to all of the Canterbury Tales, so a, di a different lens. Uh, those of you who have read the Canterbury Tales a bit, what do you remember? What are some of the tales you remember? Yes? Miller's Tale. Everybody remembers the Miller's Tale. Okay, uh, yeah, let's just, uh, the, okay, the, the first tale uh, is uh, the, ta the Knight's Tale, which is a long uh, Italian uh, uh, tragic epic romance uh, set in Troy uh, and um, in the pre-Christian past, uh, very, very, um, very handsome and philosophical and challenging, and well, it's a tragic comedy. I guess it finally ends happily, but a very, very serious opening to these uh, to the uh, general prologue. And the, the fact that Chaucer starts with Troy is significant because uh, the Londoners of Chaucer's time thought of themselves as living as, as being Troj uh, Trojans living in uh, in a new Troy. So although it's set in the past, it's very much about the present, but a very serious, somber tale. And then. Uh, the uh, Harry Bailey, who was uh, in charge of, or thought he was in charge of the sequencing of t uh, tale telling, uh, was uh, went goes to the monk. Say, now let's hear something from the monk. But Harry, uh, but uh, the uh, the Miller, 
who was drunk, all drunken, and Paul, Paul, uh, because of uh, because of drinking, uh, bullies his way uh, in. He said, "I'll tell a tale, uh, which will requite uh, the the knight's tale." And requite becomes kita, a key word, because I'll I'll get back at the knight. So he tells his tale, and those of you who remember it, what are some of the high points of it, or some of the qualities of it? It's. Um, Oh, the, well, there's a window scene. Okay, there's a, um, you, I already, it's a fablio, and I just mentioned the fablio uh, briefly. It's, um, fablio were extremely uh, bad taste uh, examples of high literature. Fablio did not come from the lower classes, but from the upper classes. They loved these, uh, uh, these scandalous stories, these scatological stories. And the window scene is a scene where, <clears throat> well, there were, uh, I was asked, the last time I talked here, I mean, the title I was given is something Chaucer funny after all these years, and said, he finally said, well, you haven't said anything that really makes Chaucer funny, and I tried to tell the story of the, uh, of the Miller's Tale, and it doesn't work if you try to, try to tell it, so I'm trying to tell it again. But the window scene has something to do with the uh, bringing together of uh, the, uh, the, the, the mouth of a would-be uh, male lover who has fallen in love with, or passionately in lust with, uh, the wife, young wife of uh, his landlord, uh, and she wants to have nothing to do with him. Uh, he's outside her window serenading her the way you're supposed to do in courtly love, uh, but she happens to be in bed with her lover, uh, and uh, so uh, she uh, she puts her arse out the window, uh, and he kisses her. Uh, and uh, starts back and he says, a beard, a beard? What's a woman doing with a beard? <laughs> uh, and there's, uh, there's, a, uh, there's another confrontation at the window, and this one has, uh, has, has to do with one of the loudest farts uh, in, in all literature. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a brilliantly told story, but obviously, uh, whereas the, the, <coughs> the Knight's Tale is full of high seriousness, this is full of low, non-seriousness. Doesn't mean it's not as important a tale as the, uh, as the Knight's Tale. Do you remember, oh yes, you, you mentioned uh, the, the, the uh, did you the mention, uh, oh, oh, the Nun's Priest Tale. What do you remember about the Nun's Priest Tale? Very little. Okay, <laughs> well, I happen to remember a lot because I spent 20 years on the, oh. yeah, I wrote my book on the Nun's Priest Tale. It's, um, it, it's an Aesopian fable. And there's a rooster and his wife, who also happens to be his sister, uh, and uh, a fox. And uh, it's when you start at school, uh, you started reading Latin, and you started with Aesop's fables, and you would have them all memorized. So everybody knew uh, these fables. But Chaucer decided that he wanted to write his own fable, and it's a tour de force. The thing is, I mean, why did I write a 650-page book about this tiny little uh, tale? It's because I think Chaucer put every uh, issue that he had been interested in and puzzled by and wanted to explore further having to do with matters intellectual and especially uh, poetic. It's, it's a kind of ars poetica. So there's so much going on in it. Um, that uh, people sort of move away. Everybody agrees it's probably Chaucer's greatest uh, Canterbury tale, but it's hard to interpret what it means because it's so anti-interpretative. Uh, it, it pulls a rug out from under you at every time. But yeah, it's my, by and far and away my favorite tale. There, there are a variety of tales told. There's Wife of Bath. Nobody's mentioned the Wife of Bath. Do you remember? Uh, hmm? A god tothed, yes, right. Uh, which, uh, hmm? Well, yeah, that was a sign of, of lechery. Lechery, right, right. Well, she, she is one of the most extraordinary, and I'd probably say the most extraordinary women in, uh, in English literature. Um, she has the longest prologue to her tale. She goes on and on and on and on and on. And that could be a joke, but it turns back against itself. And one of the things that uh, <clears throat> uh, medieval men uh, were aghast at is how women talked, right? Well, Chaucer, I think, just you know, found once he decided to write a tale for a woman, 
and have a woman uh, have a woman tell her tale that he was just going to let her go, and he gave his own uh, imagination an extraordinary amount of freedom, and she um, she carries on, she harangues, uh, she gets involved in a kind of quasi. Uh, debate with all of the male clerics that have ever said something about women. And that's about all of them, right? And one of uh, her arguments is, well, you know, who painted the lion? Why haven't women had a chance to have their say vis-a-vis -vis everything? So uh, she comes back and Chaucer comes back speaking in, in her voice and she really gets deep, deep into theological issues. Uh, and uh, she is uh, as clerical uh, as many a theologian, and she fights with the men on their own terms. She doesn't play fair, but who says they played fair either? And they, they argue about nature, they argue about sex, they argue about sex and marriage, uh, and uh, especially they argue about the mistreatment of women throughout all of uh, Western Christendom. And she is god-awful funny, uh, and she has such pleasure just Taking, uh, taking her whole audience and just twisting them this way and this way and that way and that way. So the wife of Bath, yeah. Others that you remember. And if you can, uh, what? Oh gosh, yes. What do you remember about the partner? Yeah, you did. Really? I wonder which. Which ones were they? Do you remember where they came from? Yes. I swear it again, what Carl was sorry, Pastor, we leave this down so long. For he could not think of a man that would change with this youth building Archer, and therefore moving on to Archer's name so long as he was a king of Israel. Brava, brava. <laughs> now, can you tell us about the setting for, for those lines and who's speaking? Yes. And he was greeted by three riotous youths. Yes. Who looked at him and said, Hey, old man, why are you living so long? And he said, Because I can't find anyone to meet with strangers, even for my age. And right. Therefore, I have to live as long as it's right. in my field. It's a haunting, haunting scene. And he's sort of like death. Uh, it's out of a lot of Ingmar Bergman, the movie. Uh, but he's actually seeking, uh, seeking death. The, uh, the, um, the partner, I think, of all of the, I, I'm going to stop because, uh, uh, soon because I, I would like there just to be Q&A, but I guess we're Q&A here as, as we go along. Is the, the partner is the pilgrim whom I find my, uh, myself most mm, deeply mindful of because he knows he's lost. Um, and yet he is in some way, and he's an arch deceiver. Uh, he's a liar, you know. Um, but he knows he is. What does he do when it's finally his time to, to tell a tale? Everybody says, oh, God, we don't want to hear anything from that guy. Because what is he like? He's, yeah, he's like death. He's, he, he looks sick. He doesn't belong to us. He, I mean, we want, to, we want to just send him away from our, co our company. But he tells a story. And what is a story? It's himself. And he says, I'll tell you what I do for a living. I go off into the countryside, to the churches, where these stupid yokels come up to me and they want to hear me preach. And do I ever know how to preach? And I preach and then I say, I have all of these um, these magical um, elements from my trips to the East, which will save your soul or uh, f free you from scurvy or this or that, just come up and buy one of my relics and you will be saved. However, if you don't, I know that 
that means you're living deeply in sin. And he brags about what a fraud he is and how brilliant he is in manipulating these yokels out in these, uh, these country churches. And he brings in more money than in one day than the, the, the local uh, priest will bring in in, in, a, in a year. And so he, he brags about this and brags about this and we wonder where the Canterbury Pilgrims are. Who is this? And so, and, and then it gets extremely complicated because he says at a certain moment, and thus I preach. That's the way I do it. And it sounds like, well, he's not trying to con us. That's the way he does it for that audience out here. But he's confiding that he wouldn't do this with us. And then there's a pause and he says, but one more thing. I have all these relics. Come on up. And you see how complicated it gets? How can, I mean, what is he doing with his Canterbury audience? When he confesses and then he says, now either he doesn't know what he's doing or he's involved in some extremely brilliantly evil power play with his, uh, with his audience. So there are many other tales that, are, that uh, belong on the pilgrimage. It ends, well, Chaucer actually himself, I'm stopping in three minutes right here, is finally called up. Chaucer the Pilgrim, remember him? And uh, Harry says, you know, you're, you, you're awfully shy. You just sort of be hanging back. So on. Uh, let's tell us a tale. So here, as you know, the readers, uh, we say, ah, finally, the Chaucer, real Chaucer is standing up. He's going to give us the, you know, the real Chaucer tale. Well, what do you think he does? What do you, th what do you think the tale is like? It's so brilliantly bad. <laughs> so bad. It's so bad that it's almost good if you, see, if, you, if you look into parody. But Harry Bailey, after a while, just cuts him off and he says, your rhyming is not worth a turd. Shut up! And little Chaucer says, it's the best I can do. You never cut off anybody else. And he says, is there anything else? And Chaucer said, well, I do remember something in prose I remember a long time ago. I said, all right, go tell that. Well, that, that, that takes 19 pages of this big tome of uh, the Chaucer uh, Canterbury Tales. But Harry seems to like it. Going to the very end, do the pilgrims make it to Canterbury? No. Isn't that interesting? They're still on their way. But the Canterbury Tales themselves come to an end, and this ending is the retraction. Chaucer writes a retraction. It's not long. And it comes after the very last tale, which is not a tale. It is a meditation on the seven deadly sins by the parson. Very, very serious. Not a parody or anything like that. Very, very serious. Thinking about what do you need to do to attend to your soul as you come to Canterbury or New Jerusalem to the, uh, to the last judgment. So at the very end, Chaucer writes his retraction. And it's a... Short, I think, since I've written about a complicated uh, speech act, but he says, after he says several things that are rather complicated, he says, these are my guilts, and I want to be forgiven uh, before, my my, before my judge, and therefore I retract uh, responsibility or accountability for having written all the Canterbury Tales and everything else except for the tales that um, very clearly lead us in the direction of salvation. So it seems like Chaucer, it really does seem like Chaucer has decided at the end of his life or the end of his po making of poetry to undercut all of the poetry as being of any value on a pilgrimage, if you take a pilgrimage as absolutely the essential metaphor for your trip to salvation. So I went along a little bit longer than I thought, but we do have maybe 20 minutes to uh, uh, have some questions or comments. Thanks. <clears throat> yep. I notice on the chronology that twice it appears uh, instances of black death. Yeah. Or the robotic plague. Yeah. Which 
Uh, I noticed that. <laughs> My yeah. <laughs> I, I, I noticed that the uh, Black Death was mentioned twice, and at a formative time, apparently in Chaucer's life. Yes. In his twenties, and I wonder two things. Uh, number one, in what way has it might this have influenced Chaucer's outlook? And in number two, how might that outlook have influenced uh, the Canterbury Tales? Mm. <clears throat> the Black Death does show up in the. In one tale. Uh, that's the partner's tale. Uh, and so that's a very direct uh, impact. But I think you're asking for it. Does Chaucer's uh, outlook on the world yeah. or his Christian uh, beliefs uh, or whatever, or his optimism or pessimism, uh, manifest some direct effect or? Uh, of, of the Black Death. Um, I would say something generally, first of all. I think that it's very hard with Chaucer to ever say this is what Chaucer believed. Very, very hard. Um, and then it's also very hard to say this is the, the reason that Chaucer uh, wrote this line or the reason that Chaucer uh, wrote a tale which was a happy tale or a, uh, or a saint's life or something like that was because such and such happened uh, in the 1380s, right? Or some such and such happened in his life. Chaucer seems to be, or, and let me, let me may be even more general, although you have the black death and you say, how in the world could those people be at all happy? You know, how could mer merry old England ever carry on? But curiously, when I read the literature on, uh, and the tracts of this time, I don't feel that everybody is in a state of profound horror uh, before, be, you know, before images because of the images of, uh, of death. One of the ironies is that the Black Death actually liberated, econ economically liberated people a lot because there was a need for much more labor and there was much more nobility. So I don't want to be cavalier about it. But uh, it's the, you know you, the cause and effect are not as very not as easily determined, um, and you know you could say the same thing. So I, I, I mean, we haven't had black death to deal with, but we've had some pretty horrible uh, events, war, etc., uh, in in you know in the 20th century in the modern. And people say, how could you possibly have lived through that? Um, so I, I don't have a very good answer, but I'm, I'm avoiding one which is sort of um, cause and effecty. Yeah. Um, yes. Whoa, that's a big, big question. Okay, in, in the Decameron, um, the tales are told by um, a group of uh, wealthy. Um, uh, youngish people who leave the city of Florence in order to escape uh, the plague and they decide to entertain themselves by telling ten, tale, a tale, ten tales per day over, over ten days. Did Chaucer get the idea of his telling tales with individual tale tellers from, from Boccaccio? We know that he knows, he knew the very last, the hundredth tale of the Decameron because he rewrote his version of it. It's, a, uh, 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 it's uh, the tale of Constance uh, as, and, and he gave it to one of his, uh, gave it to the clerk. But there's no evidence that he knew any of the other 99 tales. Nor is there any evidence uh, that he knew Boccaccio's name. However, two major works, one Troilus and Cresseida, Chaucer plunders from long narrative poems by Boccaccio. So obviously Chaucer knew Boccaccio's works. And in fact, Boccaccio was alive when Chaucer went to Italy. Dante was not, uh, uh, was not alive. Petrarch was still alive. No evidence that Chaucer met them but he certainly met their writings. I, I feel I've, I sort of veered, veered off a little bit. Back to the Decameron. 
no evidence that Chaucer knew any of the other tales of Decameron. So he apparently, uh, the, the, the tale of Griselda was well known. The translation of, uh, of, of the Griselda story by uh, Boccaccio seems to have had an independent life, and that's how it got into Chaucer's hands. Does that seem scholarly enough? I'm, I'm, I'm still not absolutely certain. Uh, but I mean, th th it's a debate that keeps on going among Chaucerians as to whether or not Chaucer knew uh, Boccaccio, uh, of the Decameron. People want to believe that they knew the, he knew the Decameron well. I'm still not myself persuaded. It's sort of surprising, um, but he certainly, I mean, he knew Dante. He was the first Englishman to bring Dante into, into England. So this could become a longer scholarly exchange. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah. The, um, is, are there contemporary uh, tales widely read outside the English speaking world? And if so, what are the translations like? <coughs> I'll take, uh, the, we were talking about translations. Tra the, the, question, yeah, the issue, I was, I just came with a backpack, so I didn't bring the translation that I, I don't use translations in my undergraduate course, so I didn't. But there's a wonderful translation of the Canterbury Tales. Now, it's the Norton edition, and Wendy Steiner is the translator, and I would highly recommend it because it's facing page. You have the original on one page, and you have the, the translation uh, on the other page. Uh, Wendy Steiner, uh, S-T-E-I-N-E-R, and it's the Norton uh, uh, edition. Not all the tales, but most of them. Just wonderfully, and I, I had little respect for all the translations up until that point. So there's the translation. The study of uh, Chaucer outside of England and uh, the U.S. Let me take England. <laughs> let's take me take England and the U.S. first. Um, from my vantage point, I think it's quite well. It's inevitable uh, to say that the study of Chaucer, the knowledge of Chaucer, is going downhill pretty fast. The general <clears throat> attitude in the humanities and in English depart literature part departments to things medieval is healthier than it is in its attitude towards, say, 17th century, 18th century, you know, early 19th century, uh, because there's a kind of mystique about the word uh, medieval. But <clears throat> in my undergraduate classes on Chaucer, I used to have 20, 25, even 30, 35 students taking the Canterbury Tales course. Uh, I talked to uh, my uh, young, younger colleague who taught that course last year. There were four taking that course. And I said, well, why? She said, well, they're just not reading Chaucer in high school very much anymore. Um, or they find that they're interested in other, other literatures. Uh, my undergraduate course on um, Icelandic sagas, however, brought in 20 or 30 just a few years ago. That must be Tolkien and the word Viking, et cetera. But the, the, the direction of the study of literatures uh, is, as far as I can tell, uh, and I'm not trying to monitor it very carefully, moving in the direction of, of world literature, uh, et cetera. And you can see that there are good reasons to think that that may be uh, the way to go, although I think we're losing something by losing the study of... Uh, so in, in other countries, I don't have an answer. I know that there are some wonderful surprising stories of Chaucer being uh, translated into Swahili, uh, etc. All right? But I think that they really are um, not representative of, of a widespread phenomenon in, in Africa or what have you. I mean, they're, for instance, they're, they're Chinese. I run into chi young Chinese scholars um, who just love Chaucer, and you know, they come to our conferences. They're not ready quite to, to, give, uh, to give papers. Um, uh, but generally speaking, Chaucer's not sweeping, sweeping the universe. One or two other matters, and then maybe we can close down. Yes. You said that uh, Chaucer was an iris, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, in my uh, <clears throat> book, I use a Venn diagram that I didn't invent. Uh, and there's one circle is irony, another overlapping circle is satire, and another overlapping uh, circle is satire, irony. Yeah, it's not ambiguity. There's another one that I've forgotten. Um, but I like that diagram because it shows you that um, all irony deals with some satiric elements. All satire deals with some ironic elements. Satire tends to be ex ex extra literary. It's directed at something out in the world and it's attacking it. Okay? And that's just what you said, that Chaucer seems to be attacking the church. Well, if you say the target is the church, I, I'm not being, this is the move you're making. You're saying this figure represents this idea, this reality of the church. Well, first of all, there are about seven or eight religious on this pilgrimage. Some of them are, I mean, the, the parson is just a hero. He's extraordinarily wonderful. Well, maybe he represents the church. I think what Chaucer is doing is, yeah, he's attacking. What made, one of the points I was trying to make there is that we are turning the irony, it doesn't feel very ironic, into satire and saying, I'm going to read it satirically, fair enough, because I think he really is attacking something over there. But what is it he's attacking? You might say he's attacking venality. He's attacking, he's attacking hypocrisy. He's, he's attacking uh, men in the church who are not at all religious themselves. But that's not the same, and that's not necessarily the same thing as attacking the church, okay? So I, uh, to try to put a little bit of nuance into what I was trying to say is that Chaucer is asking us to move rather fluently, fluidly, uh, from a number of different positions that are available to us in reading the monk and I think really inviting us to think about how this, this guy is a travesty, uh, to play on my own surname, a travesty of anybody who has a religious vocation. He is as non-religious as, uh, um, as you could find anybody to be. But there are some words, he, I mean, a real satirist would have gone further. He would have taken a word like venery and let no ambiguity uh, be there. Uh, and, and he would have taken, I mean, there's a lot of satires of monks where they are so given over to gluttony that they're, you know, they're puking on the tables and things like that. The satirists would take it further. But point well made. But there's a light satire and a heavy satire. That's right. That's right, right. That's, there's a light satire and a heavy satire. Um, one of the ways Chaucer gets quite uh, satirical is he has two pilgrims going at each other. They're both religious. They hate each other. And they just attack each other uh, with no holds barred. Okay? They, 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 they get into a fight on the pilgrimage. They almost strangle each other. But Chaucer doesn't do that himself. He lets two of his characters go, go at each other. So it's, it's you know, it's finally, it's, it's what, what is in a word. But, when I think of satire, I, I think of satire like juvenile, or um, give, me, give me some other satirists, um, Jonathan Swift or something like that, who just, you know, they, 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 there's, no, there's no subtlety. It's all full, full bore. Yeah. I, I would totally agree with that. I think that Chaucer is doing that all the time. Finally, what is being judged? Ourselves. You, you, were, you were talking about the partner. Finally, are we going to throw the partner out? Are we going to say he's unsalvageable? That he doesn't deserve to be on the, uh, on the pilgrimage? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, yes, I think so. Judge not that you be not judged. 
I think Chaucer's really, this is what makes Chaucer, I think, finally a very, very moral, without moralizing, poet. Always, you know, I talk about the dialogue between the poet and, and the reader. Where do you want to stand? How are you going to, what are you going to say about this one word? What does it mean? Chaucer will keep you know, leaning on a word until finally it looks like it means the opposite of what it, we think it should mean. So where are we? So I think, I mean, the, the metaphor of the pilgrimage is really a significant one without becoming didactic, but, you know, reading is a kind of moral enterprise. It's a spiritual enterprise. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to sort of think you're reading the Bible, not at all. But it's, it, it's, it's, it's something that really entails a lot of Christian uh, uh, responsibility. So with that, bless you. <laughs> I think I'll stop right there. Thanks a lot. Thank you.